While writing my summary for Zena Herbert's The Dancer and Heat, I had a very difficult time seeing any application in what I was reading for today. There were lots of topics I thought it was touching on, patriarchy, male gaze, violent censorship, but since it didn't use the actual terms patriarchy or male gaze, I was considering glossing over this chapter with a few sentences and moving on to another topic. Rereading it was very helpful, and I decided that understanding the vandalism of feminist artist Zena Herbert sculptures actually can give us insight into contemporary controversies relevant to feminist and art. I will first discuss Zena Herbert's article describing the vandalism of her work, then discuss Hillary Robinson's comments introducing the article. In my opinion, it's difficult to understand what Hillary Robinson is talking about if we don't know what the heck happened to Zena Herbert's sculptures. Herbert's article gives the reader context on how some feminist artists of the 80s believed the women's movement had failed them. Also, according to editor Hillary Robinson, this article sets the tone for the remainder of the book. Herbert begins by telling us about a vandalism trial of five women who were accused of smashing sculptures. Later, it is revealed that these women were apparently tutors who believed her artwork was sexist and racist. Though Herbert's sculptures were also vandalized, Herbert considered the newspaper coverage to be, quote, gory and inaccurate. First, she did not like that the newspapers did not mention her by name, considering this to be an act of erasing her. Second, she did not like how the newspaper described sculptures being damaged, suggesting the word smashed as more accurate. Herbert recounts her time as a student at Leeds Polytechnic making ceramic sculptures of women and discusses the importance of her race, ethnic heritage, and upbringing for her work. Herbert then discusses the two vandalized sculptures, of the two, I only have a picture of heat to show you. Given that it was destroyed, we'll have to imagine the dancer based on its description. Herbert describes the dancer as the torso of a woman without arms or lower legs, on her knees, posed this way because, according to Herbert, women in the Atlas foothills dance while on their knees, and she remembered these kinds of dances from childhood. The arms and legs were not included because Herbert did not see a need to include them. However, some viewers understood this work as a mutilated torso. She, quote, made a velvet headdress with brass bezels and stranded bugle beads from the ears to the breasts. Herbert explains that nipple and labia rings are common for women from her home, just as testicle rings are common for men. From Herbert's description, it appears that the labia ring was the main source of contention over her sculpture. Herbert calls it shameful that some women would react negatively to her artwork in the labia ring. The second of Herbert's vandalized sculptures was Heat. A nipple and buttocks were shown in the original, and in order to meet with YouTube's content policy, I have censored these parts of the image. Herbert claims these two sculptures constituted a year's worth of work. She describes some of her college classmates' comments. Female students thought, quote, the sculptures had a powerful presence infrequently associated with women. Men felt uncomfortable and overawed. I wish to underscore how Herbert describes men being made uncomfortable by her sculpture as an intended feature of the work. She wanted men to be, quote, confronted with a statement they could not ignore. On the night the exhibition opened, Herbert was still making jewelry for heat, which, like the dancer, included jewelry connected to a labia ring. It was at this point the women tutors began complaining about Herbert's sculptures, and by Monday the artworks had been smashed. Quote, the horror of seeing another woman hammer faces and breasts, even clay ones, is indescribable. I felt sentenced, unheard, by a self-appointed executioner judge. Herbert is understandably irate. A group of college women determined her sculptures to be sexist and racist without speaking to her, and proceeded to vandalize her sculptures. Herbert defends her work from this charge by claiming that the labia rings were not meant to be viewed as chains. Her women were supposed to be free, not slaves in a degrading position. Because her sculptures were based on photographs of herself, Herbert makes an intriguing argument. Quote, if clay women made from my photographs are obscene, then I, by merely being female, must be obscene, and that is ludicrous. This is a reducto ad absurdum argument. Premise A, if the sculptures are obscene, then the photos the sculptures are based on must be obscene. Premise B, if the photos are obscene, then Herbert's female body must be obscene. Premise C, my female body is not obscene, ergo, the sculptures are not obscene. This argument is meant to persuade feminists like those who smashed Herbert's sculpture. 
Herbert is arguing that if a woman treats her sculptures as obscene, they are treating Herbert's own female body as obscene. Y you can see how this argument would be persuasive to someone with a feminist perspective. Herbert's article continues with what is, in my opinion, a passionate trouncing of censorship and iconoclasm. Who appointed the Vandals the guardians of all women? Who empowered them to determine how women may be depicted in sculpture under threat of the hammer? However, Herbert's application of this principle is fascinating and reveals her feminist politics. Herbert argues that if work like hers is not allowed by feminists, quote, the field will be left to pornography with the absurd image of woman the only one made or showed. In my understanding, Herbert's argument could be understood this way. Herbert's nude sculptures of women with labia rings must be accepted by feminism or else sexist pornographic depictions of women made for the male gaze will dominate the culture instead. Herbert's depiction of strong female sexuality, the kind which was intended to make men feel uncomfortable, is defined as an honest representation of women's sexuality. In the end, I don't read Herbert's article as a vigorous defense of free speech for everyone, but a feminist argument for her right to artistic expression in particular, and it's an argument which targets white feminists. Herbert's closing paragraph is quite charged, and I don't think I can do it justice without quoting it in full. Quote, if it is thought right that some women have dictatorial jurisdiction over other women, I have misunderstood the whole aim of the women's movement. Over the past 20 years, I have been spat on in the street for holding hands with my girlfriend. I have been ostracized at work for saying woman is entitled to her own sexuality. I have been derided as unnatural because I refuse to accept what society says is my proper place. Thousands of us have rejected men's authority. We do not need a master. We have no need of a mistress either. Notice the language of women's place and male masters being utilized. Yes, this is a screed against white feminists who vandalized her work, but Herbert is also making use of feminist concepts like patriarchy and male gaze, though I'll grant she does not use these exact terms while describing the concepts. So, what to make of this? What is the relevance to feminism and art? First, issues of racism. Quoting Robinson, how do white women in a country that has colonized so many others react to work that arises out of a different cultural heritage to their own? What I think is noteworthy here is that Robinson explicitly identifies this as a problem of racism. The white feminist instructors and the white British need to be better. The second major topic is issues of art education. Robinson asks whether colleges are providing appropriate tutoring, quote, for women, for mature students, for black students, and students of color. She is concerned with the positions of power tutors hold and whether they can cross over from one context to another, from the art history classroom to the art studio, or from one medium to another, such as from painting to film. In my opinion, we here see Robinson focusing on college hierarchy and institutional power, a theme which was discussed in her introduction. She would like to see art institutions restructured in such a way so that a similar incident will not occur again. The third major topic, issues of imagery. Robinson expresses a view of male gaze which is so frank, I think we need to quote her in full. Quote, in a culture where women's bodies are the repository for the pornographic fantasies of a large proportion of the male population, is it possible for women to reconstruct images of their own body? Or have we so internalized sexist visual traditions that we can't help but reproduce them? Did you catch that? Internalized misogyny. Who are the internalized misogynists in this case? The white feminists who vandalized the sculptures because they believed they were sexist and degrading depictions of women. In my own words, I would describe the dilemma Robinson is concerned with as follows. Can women create sexual or nude images of women which are not patriarchal, or do they have to create an entirely new language for feminist meaning? The fourth major point, issues of context. Would Zena Herbert's work have meant something else if shown alongside only women artists, or only feminist artists, or only non-British artists, asks Robinson. Is feminist art for a particular audience or for the mainstream? In my opinion, this again underscores Robinson's concern with bringing feminist politics into the mainstream culture through the vehicle of art. Robinson closes her introduction with a remarkable, illuminating quote. 
the politics of feminism arise out of personal experience and are tested by activism on every scale. The theoretical articles in the last section of the book will be worthless if we don't also listen to the direct experience of the women in this first section and all the others like them. Does this sound familiar to you? In my opinion, Robinson is asking her audience to listen and believe. The reason being, without personal experience, feminist theory cannot be properly understood. The data of feminist art theory is allegory, and the method of testing feminist art theory is activism. If you do not have ears to listen and believe, you cannot understand feminist art theory, or so argues Robinson. Here is my personal takeaway from reading Zena Herbert's personal statement, The Dancer and Heat. Within radical feminist art, there are disagreements and division over what constitutes sexist or degrading art. While Herbert defends her art with a rousing critique of dictatorial censorship and destruction of art deemed sexist, she makes her argument on the basis of her identity and her feminist politics, not on the basis of something like free speech or free expression. When arguing with someone who believes that violent and destructive censorship of problematic art is justified, you might find Zena Herbert's story a useful point to refer to. Perhaps someone who is so fixated on promoting their view of social justice through violence and vandalism might not listen to you, but would find Herbert's intersectional argument persuasive. However, I find it sad that not only has the violent destruction of art, deemed sexist or offensive, been a problem since the 1980s, it remains a problem today. And at least within this anthology, the critique of vandalism is based not on a shared principle like commitment to free speech, but on the sexual orientation, race, and ethnic identity of the victim of vandalism. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. In our next video, we will continue working our way through the personal statements section of this anthology. Honest repu Herbert's depict <laughs> or only non British or <coughs> 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 <coughs>